Our next speaker is Dr. Michael Wallace. Dr. Michael Wallace is professor of medicine at Mayo Clinic, Florida. He's also the editor-in-chief of GI Endoscopy, and he will present um, uh, about the large polyp and when we choose um, surgery. Well, thank you uh, for your uh, uh, kind attention. Uh, Raju, uh, Raju's talk and mine will dovetail, I think, very nicely. Uh, he and I conferred over the topic um, and I'll focus largely on surgical indications, but obviously this uh, boundary between surgical and endoscopic resection. I'll also show some of the, uh, I'll go a little bit more in depth uh, in some of the evidence base for how effective are these procedures. Uh, these are my disclosures. Um, so overall, I'm gonna provide a comparison of endoscopic versus surgical resection of superficial uh, large colon polyps, and these include the non-invasive lesions, the tubular adenomas, villus adenomas, uh, as well as the superficially invasive uh, uh, carcinomas. How do we select them? I'll reiterate uh, some of the important points Raju made. What are the outcomes of endoscopic versus surgical resection? And then close with some summary and recommendations. So as Raju mentioned, there's a growing interest in advanced resection techniques in the West. These started about 20 to 30 years ago uh, in Japan. Uh, EMR has been used now in the United States for more than a decade and a half and is now widely available at most referral centers and academic centers. ESD, on the other hand, is less widely available. Uh, many of us, including myself, uh, uh, took time in our careers to, to uh, spend uh, uh, time in Japan and learn this technique and have uh, brought this back and uh, now run uh, many uh, training courses around the country um, in how to do this and the interest in ESD is certainly growing. And I think as a result, the net effect is that nearly all of these uh, large lateral spreading polyps can be resected by one of the two available endoscopic methods. If we compare them overall, EMR, here endoscopic mucosal resection, is a highly effective technique. It has a moderate recurrence rate, although as Raju mentioned, this may not be so important if it's a non-invasive lesion because almost all Recurrences can be managed uh, with simple snare resection techniques. It's a relatively fast and easy uh, procedure that is uh, well incorporated into our routine uh, colonoscopy practice. It's widely available, at least at most uh, referral centers, and it's got a low complication rate. Uh, ESD, on the other hand, is also very highly effective. It has a very low recurrence rate. On the other hand, it's quite time consuming. Typical procedure times for ESD uh, are two to three hours compared to uh, less than an hour for an EMR procedure. It's technically much more demanding and has a much steeper and longer learning curve, and it definitely has higher complications, particularly the perforation, as Raju mentioned, up to about 5%, and even in expert hands and higher than that, certainly on the learning curve. Surgery, and we're mostly talking about uh, laparoscopic hemicolectomies as well as the transanal uh, procedures. We know these are highly effective. They essentially have no recurrence um, uh, although there are some cases where uh, large lesions are underinterpreted uh, and there's recurrence at the margin. Uh, it's the most invasive of all these procedures, and unlike the endoscopic procedures, generally requires a three to four day length of stay hospitalization, which drives up the cost, and there's uh, significantly higher complication uh, rates, uh, leakage, and, and later um, uh, uh, bowel obstructions. Um, uh, delayed bowel obstructions, and certainly higher costs, which I'll show uh, some, some data for shortly. If we look at head-to-head -head comparisons of EMR versus ESD, there are no randomized controlled trials. Uh, there's large cohort trials, the largest coming from uh, Yutaka Saito uh, at the National Cancer Center Tokyo, uh, comparing his experience with EMR uh, and ESD. And this was largely a, um, a transition from his early practice of EMR to where they now perform ESD for almost all uh, large lateral spreading lesions in the colon. Uh, the on-block resection rate is certainly higher with ESD, but the perforation rate, and again, this is the, probably the most experienced group in the world, um, is about 4.9%. Most of those, however, are recognized during the time of the procedure, and the vast majority of these now can be closed with endoscopic clipping or suturing techniques. It's only about one in 200 that are delayed perforation that result in surgical uh, uh, emergencies. Delayed bleeding, interestingly, is a little bit lower, perhaps because of the very careful dissection of the submucosal plane and coagulation of vessels. But procedure time, as you can see, on average, about two hour long procedure versus about a half hour long procedure with EMR. And recurrence rate is um, uh, essentially zero with an on-block 
uh, ESD uh, versus around 15% for EMR. Um, what are the main issues that we uh, face when looking at a lesion? When you find a large polyp, um, uh, uh, how do you decide which uh, technique to apply? The questions that uh, you need to ask yourself to make that uh, decision, is it a cancer? Uh, is it removable on block with the current limit of our snares at about two to two and a half centimeters? Uh, ESD has no lateral size limit. Uh, lesions uh, well into the 10, even 15 centimeters uh, have been reported removed on block with ESD. And importantly, are lymph node metastases likely because that is the absolute boundary of what can be removed endoscopically. So EMR is in theory appropriate for suspected non-invasive pathology and suspected because we don't know the pathology until we remove it. The biopsies are not always accurate. Uh, generally, uh, early carcinomas uh, less than two centimeters because that's the size of the snare that can remove one of these on block and flat or lateral spreading lesions. ESD, uh, in theory, should be used where there's proven or suspected early submucosal invasion, a T1SM1, and greater than two centimeters, again, because of the size limit of our snares. And surgery, uh, lastly, generally should be considered where there's suspected deep invasion or confirmed deep, in, deep invasion if an endoscopic technique is applied first, or if the pathology suggests a high risk for lymphatic metastases, such as lymphovascular invasion. This is the Paris classification. On the left here, we have our typical pedunculated and sessile polyps, which are almost always benign adenomas and can be removed with standard resection techniques. When we get into the flat or lateral spreading lesions, uh, we have uh, three general uh, morphologies. We have flat, slightly elevated, totally flat, and flat depressed. And then the groups uh, three would be uh, ulcerated. So for the flat lesions, general, the general rule is depressed, uh, conveys a more worrisome feature and suggests early uh, carcinoma, and that's when you should be thinking about applying an on-block method. If there's ulceration within the lesion, those are almost always deeply invasive and generally are a contraindication for endoscopic resection, or they're mixed types as well. But generally, depressed lesions uh, should be resected by a wide field technique, and ulcerated lesions should be sent for surgery. Here's just some examples, a very uh, uh, superficially elevated lesion. Uh, here's a generally uh, completely flat lesion. Uh, this is a sessile serrated uh, polyp, almost completely flat. And here's an ulcerated surface on top of a polyp. So this is the key feature when we see ulceration uh, on the surface. Uh, that should uh, indicate a referral for surgery. Uh, if you do try to inject a submucosal lifting agent underneath these, often they will not lift, which is another indicator of deep submucosal invasion. Uh, Raj, you touched on this uh, NICE classification. It's changed names over the years from NICE to SANO to uh, now the JNET, but the basic principle is the same. Uh, we talked about hyperplastic polyps and adenomas earlier. Once you get these brown vessels on the surface, you can further classify them as somewhat irregular, which are usually a superficially invasive lesion, versus highly irregular or complete loss of uh, vessel surface pattern. And this is the pattern that's associated with a deeply invasive lesion. And these are the lesions where we would, uh, where surgery is the uh, preferred method of resection. Uh, we also use the term la lateral spreading tumor or lateral spreading lesion, LSL. I mean, these are subdivided into the granular type, which is just a series of sessile raised lesions, as you can see here. These are lower risk lesions than the non-granular type, which is a more sandpaper, smooth surface. Um, and you can have mixed types, even arguably there's a, a larger granule in this mixed type. But anytime you see a non-granular pattern, uh, that's worrisome for invasion. And in this case, there's central depression, as you can see by the scalloping at the three o'clock position. So this is a lesion that would be high risk for deep submucosal invasion and should be sent for surgery. Let me just give an example of a wide field EMR. If you've not seen this technique before, and I'm just gonna skip ahead, this was published in Video GIE. Um, uh, the journal for which Raju is the editor, and I'll skip the introductory part. So this is in the cecum. It's a large granular lateral spreading lesion. Perhaps we could turn the room lights uh, and the uh, podium lights down just a little bit. Um, so you can see it's just a series of sessile lesions that are spreading laterally. Uh, this is uh, a low-risk lesion, so we will in, uh, perform a piecemeal endoscopic resection. We start at one edge of it, injecting it, and we use uh, modified snares. These are a very stiff wire snare. It's got the extra uh, spiral, uh, and uh, many people call this the spiral snare. 
Um, the lesion, uh, just like you saw in the cold polypectomy technique, the snare catheter is pushed into that submucosal cushion and the edge is resected. Once you start resecting at the edge, you simply continue that process, marching across the lesion. Uh, the general goal is to try to use the submucosal edge here to continue uh, laying the snare down so that you get a contiguous uh, 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 resection with no gaps, bridges uh, in between. Um, and this process continues. Uh, generally, this takes about 30 minutes or so, and I'll just skip ahead on the video. Uh, this, uh, this lesion was quite large, probably about six or seven centimeters. Uh, and in the very end, we can uh, carefully inspect to make sure that there's no uh, remnant uh, 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 neoplastic epithelium at the edges. You can see this very clean submucosal surface uh, uh, of this completely resected lesion. How effective is this? We have a very large cohort uh, study ongoing, uh, the Australian uh, consortium, the so-called ACE consortium led by Dr. Michael Bork. Uh, this is their most recent publication in the journal Gut. A thousand patients who are referred for uh, consideration of EMR uh, they excluded some with, for lack of follow-up, but had about 800 patients with long-term follow-up. They also excluded about 80 out of 1,000 patients that were considered unresectable due to a worrisome lesion for invasive carcinoma. So about 8% of lesions referred to their group uh, were deemed uh, not candidates for endoscopic resection. The remainder uh, underwent endoscopic resection. I'll just summarize the outcomes on the right here. Of these 1,000 patients, um, they, that underwent endoscopic resection. They had early recurrence in 16%. These were non-invasive recurrences. And of those early recurrences, 95% were treated by uh, additional EMR or ablative methods. They had late recurrence in a little over 6%. If, <coughs> if you take the entire cohort, only three out of 1,000 patients who underwent EMR uh, were not cured by that EMR. So an extremely high, uh, effective uh, long-term outcome uh, noting that uh, it does require close follow-up because of that recurrence rate. What do the guidelines say? So when you have a cancer in a polyp, um, uh, I think it's important that we look to uh, national guidelines. There are important medical legal issues, and this is really the document that defines what is the standard of care in the United States. This is the NCCN guideline, um, the most widely uh, used for management of cancer. Um, this is the segment in the colon cancer NCCN guideline that deals with sessile polyps. And I'll say, I'll just take them mostly for verbatim. So the indications for surgical resection according to current U.S. guidelines are a submucosally invasive cancer, and I would note that the quote intramucosal carcinoma, an M1, M2, or M3, is not considered cancer in this guideline. So that's important because we often throw out the term intramucosal cancer um, this guideline does not apply to intramucosal cancer. These are generally referred to as intraepithelial high-grade neoplasia. And so uh, on-block resection methods are not necessary for such lesions. We're only talking about submucosally invasive carcinomas. So if you have a submucosally invasive carcinoma and it was resected by piecemeal or it had high-risk histology, poorly differentiated angiolymphatic invasion, or a positive margin. Those are the current guidelines for when surgery should be applied. Also, when you suspect one of these based on its morphology that I showed, the paris or the surface pattern, uh, that's when you should uh, consider for upfront surgical resection. And I just add a little quote from this. Uh, uh, this is from the NCCN guidelines. When one looks closely at the data, malignant sessile polyps with favorable histology can be successfully treated with endoscopic polypectomy. Uh, these are the recent European guidelines. Uh, they recommend, and this really just distinguishes EMR versus ESD. They say EMR is preferred for most lesions. ESD should be considered for lesions greater than two centimeters where there is suspicion of superficial submucosal invasion. Uh, rectal lesions, they recommend all large non-granular polyps and uh, very large greater than three centimeter granular or mixed type polyps. So let me just uh, touch on a little bit of data. There isn't a randomized control trial currently completed comparing endoscopic to surgical resection. There are some ongoing, so we have to look at cohort and modeling studies. So this is an, uh, a study from Italy. It looked at a practice where they took patients who were initially referred for surgical resection, 
but the patient, as is quite common now, identified that they may be a candidate for EMR and self-referred to an EMR expert. These were 82 patients self-referred for EMR after they had been primarily referred for surgery. Complete resection was uh, performed and uh, completed in 84% of those. They had adverse events uh, in about 15 to 20 percent, all of them managed endoscopically, typically bleeding uh, managed endoscopically. And of those, there were about 10 percent which were submucosal cancers and required salvage surgery. So still the majority of lesions, uh, even that were initially sent for surgery, um, but then diverted to EMR, could be treated by endoscopic resection techniques. What about the cost? It's not surprising that surgery is more expensive. This is the data to support that. Uh, this is the, the Australian group again. So this is uh, 1,489 patients who underwent EMR, and then they estimated what the surgical cost would have been had they undergone uh, standard surgical procedures, usually laparoscopic right hemicolectomy or transanal uh, resection for a rectal lesion. The costs were based on current uh, ICD-9 and CPT codes and generally assumed a, uh, an average three and a half uh, day length of stay. Uh, these were the cost under various assumptions, the EMR, which included, um, uh, this was base case if there were adverse events and adverse events with the use of propofol, which most of these are done uh, under in the United States. These were similarly the cost for surgical resections, in, uh, including uh, surgery uh, with and without uh, adverse events uh, associated with the surgery. So a substantial reduction in cost in these modeling studies with endoscopic techniques, that's not surprising. It's generally an outpatient uh, procedure um, uh, done, and, this in, and that includes, by the way, the, uh, the cost of the follow-up, which is usually two endoscopies uh, over the next 18 months. What about estimated mortality? Again, this comes from the Australian uh, consortium. Uh, this is about 1,000 patients who underwent endoscopic resection, several of whom were quite high risk, uh, and these included patients uh, with predicted mortalities greater than 5%. Uh, they had a 0% mortality versus a predicted operative mortality of about 3% had they undergone surgical resection. Again, a modeling study with its limitations. So just to summarize, I think in, in the United States, uh, virtually all non-invasive uh, colorectal polyps of all sizes can be resected endoscopically. Uh, surgery should generally be considered after uh, specialist review. Um, there are some geographical limitations. There are not necessarily EMR centers in every available community, um, but I think we should at least consent the patient or, or notify the patient that it is a possibility uh, that this can be done effectively and safely. EMR versus surgery uh, versus ESD is based on the predicted invasiveness, and I think EMR remains the most common method of resection in Western countries with surgery reserved for deeper invasion, either suspected or confirmed at the initial resection. Thank you.